Welcome to Inspired Edinburgh, the home of powerful conversations. I'm Elliot Reeves and my guest today is Peter Hitchens. Peter is an award-winning journalist, author, broadcaster and renowned conservative polemicist. Having spent in excess of 40 years in Fleet Street, you have been a specialist reporter on education, labour and industry, politics, defence and diplomacy, as well as a resident correspondent in Moscow and Washington. After being shortlisted in 2007 and 2009, you won the Orwell Prize in Political Journalism in 2010. You've written for The Spectator, the American Conservative magazines, as well as The Guardian, Prospect and The New Statesman. Now writing for The Mail on Sunday, you have a weekly column and blog in which you debate directly with readers. To date, you have written eight books, including The Abolition of Britain, The Rage Against God and The War We Never Fought. Your most recent book, The Phony Victory, was published in August 2018 and addresses the national myth of the Second World War, which you assert did long-term damage to Britain and its position in the world. A regular on British radio and television, you've appeared on Question Time, Any Questions, This Week, The Daily Politics and The Big Questions. You've presented several documentaries on Channel 4 and in the late 1990s you co-presented a programme on Talk Radio UK. You have also visited nearly 60 countries during the course of your work. Peter, it's an honour and a privilege to have you here. Welcome to the show. Pleasure. <laughs> that's, that's quite a, an introduction. Well, it's a, it's a reasonable list <laughs> of things. Uh, I suppose sometimes people say, what business do you have expressing your opinions each week in a national newspaper? And my answer would really be the list that you've just provided. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't just emerged from nowhere and, and been given a column. It took me a long time to get to it. And I think there is a certain amount of experience there, which I could call on to say, yes, yeah, so actually, I'd, there is a reason why I might have a, a more developed, more interesting, and frankly, better opinion on these subjects than you have. <laughs> Not want to talk yourself up, though. Well, I don't see any point. I was actually brought up not to blow my own trumpet, but okay. in another world which no longer exists. This mm. is a world in which you have to blow your own trumpet. No one else will do it for you. And indeed, if you don't, people will try and shut you up. So I'm afraid I've had to drop that, like quite a lot of the maxims of my childhood, because they no longer work. It's uh, the, the story I always tell about morals is they're useless. If other people don't follow them, I was brought up, for instance, if you're walking up a, a train to, to stand aside for other people coming the other way. Uh, if you do that now, people think you're having a heart attack, and so they push past you. It's futile. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so the whole point of it is lost. And it, it's the same in a society where everybody has become brash and self-aggrandizing. If you are self-effacing, mm -hmm. then people say thank you very much and walk all over you. So I've decided not to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, well, we're definitely going to explore your er earlier life um, and your views really on modern day Britain. Um, I thought we'd try and start on a, a, more, a sort of positive note. Um, one of the questions, I mean, you said to me when we've spoken previously, you don't wish to be asked certain questions about left wing politics. Well, I don't wish to be asked. Them, I'm bored to <laughs> tears of being asked. Why did you used to be left wing? Uh, and why have you become right wing? I now say, look, look it up. I've said it. I've answered the question so many times now. You yeah. must be able to think of something else. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I stopped being left wing usually before the person who asked me this was born. Yeah. So it really is <laughs> something that's a, a bobbing along in the past, really. Yes. Well, I promise not to ask you that. Well, you can if you'd I, like. <laughs> no, I'm, don't I, don't be not surprised <laughs> if you get dusty answer. <laughs> not at all. I mean, it's it's more that I don't wish to, I suppose, rehash. The, the content no, and that I'm you've sure had anybody, in other interviews as anybody well. who watches this won't want to hear all these things again. Well, they want something, <laughs> you never something know. new. <laughs> so here's the thing then. What um, do people never ask you that you wish they would? Oh, I, I don't actually want to be asked questions at all. I, I'd be perfectly, really? perfectly happy not to be asked questions in the slightest. I, I, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm no... Um, I, I, I'm fairly vain. I have a pretty high opinion of myself, but <laughs> I, I think I'm quite interesting. And one of the reasons why I don't myself ever attempt to do interviews in my trade is because I tend to find myself more interesting than the person I'm interviewing. But I really don't particularly want to be asked questions, and I'm certainly not going to offer you on a plate a series of questions which I don't particularly want to be asked or anything like that. You, know, you have to think of them yourself. Okay. What is it about yourself that you think is interesting? Again, I have to leave that to other people. Here I am. You asked me here. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't write to you and say, "Look, can you can you please interview me?" I, th I think you're, you're, you're the one who has I, to no, tell no, me. No, no. I, I do. I do find here. you very interesting. Well, there you are. Then you, you can um, answer the question better than I can. Then. Uh, yeah, no, but you you said of yourself that you find yourself interesting. I find myself interesting, but doesn't everybody find themselves interesting? Um, 
I'm not sure that... that it's the, it's I'm not the standard. Sure, I mean, if you're having a conversation with someone you've never met in your life, you've been, you've put next to them at a, at a dinner, the absolute certain way of making sure the conversation goes well is to ask them about themselves. That's, yeah, that's true. It always works. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's um, how to win friends and influence people 101. But it, it just it establishes the point. Everybody thinks that they're interesting. Why shouldn't they? Yeah. I'm interesting to myself. The question is why I'm interesting to anybody else. <laughs> I, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go back to your uh, your early life and sort of set the scene for people who perhaps aren't uh, as familiar with you. What was your early life like? My early life was idyllic. I can't. <laughs> I have no complaints about it at all. I, it, it didn't do me any harm. I say that probably it did, but I was brought up in what was really the 1930s. Technically, it was the 1950s, but in fact, uh, a service family. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, more. Uh, more traditional uh, than, and, and probably more imperial than a normal family would have been, going to schools where certainly until, I suppose I was about 10 or 11, we were still being educated very much in a way in which uh, my father's generation would have entirely recognized. And so I'm a very old fashioned person. I, go, I, I stretch back uh, in, in, into eras where things were normal, which are now not merely abnormal, but verging on the criminal. And I just, it's, but I, was, I feel very fortunate at having lived in that and seen it when it was a reality rather than having to imagine it. And mm -hmm. it, gives me, it gives me things, it gives me strengths and pieces of knowledge, which other people don't have. And it gives me a way of looking at the world, which other people don't have, a critical mm -hmm. standpoint, which other people don't possess. I'd say it was, we were left so much uh, to our own devices as children. People say this all the time, it's perfectly true. The day would begin, we'd go off walking or on bicycles or, or, or roaming the streets with other children with a, with, with a little bit of money to buy something and, and expected home later on. It, it was idyllic and I went to, to boarding schools in, in particular the one where I spent most time in the middle of the, of the Devon countryside surrounded by rivers and forests and, and moorland. It was, again, it was, it was a wonderful introduction to the world and I have no complaints about it at all. And I'm never going to write a misery memoir. <laughs> were, were you close to your, your parents? Oh, particularly, no. I didn't see very much of them as a, a, a half the year at boarding school. And when I was at home, uh, my, my mother was one of the earliest um, uh, wage slave mothers off running a shop. So there we were, left to our own devices. So we didn't really see very much of them at all. Mm -hmm. And these were not the, this was not the era of the, of, of the, um, of great warmth and openly displayed affection, which everybody's used to now. People were more formal with each other, and I was more formal with my parents than people would be now, but it didn't seem abnormal to me at the time. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. What were your thoughts, or, or what do I suppose are your thoughts now on boarding school? Well, I'd say I, I don't think, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't send a child of my own at the age of seven to boarding school. Uh, because it just it doesn't it doesn't seem to me to be a particularly good idea for many reasons. But I'm not sorry that it happened to me. I wasn't thrashed. I wasn't sexually abused. I got a pretty good education out of it. I lived in a beautiful 18th century manor house on the, on the top of a hill, surrounded by a magnificent countryside. I had plenty of open air activities, masses of time to myself lots of opportunities to read in an extensive library, and uh, what could I possibly complain about? Mm -hmm. So I don't. But so that's, that particular type of experience probably doesn't exist anymore anyway. Uh, it wouldn't, the, the sort of boarding school education which I had could no longer happen. So in, in any case, and, but as I say, I, 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 I won't complain about it because it, 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 it gave me a lot of strength. I have to say, I reckon that the most difficult thing I ever did in my life was setting up a, a newspaper bureau in Moscow from nothing. I went out to Moscow with a suitcase containing a fax machine, 5,000 pounds in cash and some clothes. And that was all I had and a smattering of Russian. And in three months, I managed to establish an office and find a place to live. I could never have done that, I don't think, if I hadn't had my boarding school experience. Really? It gives you a certain ability to, to, to to carry on uh, in, uh, in, uh, in moments which might otherwise cause people to despair. Yeah, I, I, I've heard, um, I believe I'm right in saying um, Prince Philip had said of Charles uh, that the best thing that ever happened to him was going to boarding school, or that he had to in order to become the person that he 
had to be. I'm it was, not, it was not sure that Charles agrees with that. Yeah, I'm sure he does doesn't. Has. I'm sure he doesn't. But there you are. <laughs> yeah. And there is, there is boarding school and there's the Gordon student of the 1960s. It, yeah. I think they may not be necessarily the same thing. <laughs> okay. But there you are. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that I actually hadn't realised was, I mean, your mother passed away very young. She took her own life. Well, that were, is true, yes. You, you were 22 at the time. Yeah, but if it, I had anything to do with it, you wouldn't know that. It's just my late brother decided to make a public thing of it. So every, it, it was a very peculiar thing. After he did that, uh, everybody I ever met practically knew this very private fact about me, uh, which is an odd thing, because it's not something you particularly want to talk to strangers about. And I still don't. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll ask you a question, and, and you don't have to answer it, but what sort of an impact did that have on you at that time? Well, profound grief. I, well, it, it's, it, it's not a, it, it's, it's a disturbing, distressing and unpleasant experience to lose a parent under any circumstances. Of course. But under those circumstances, it's considerably worse. Mm -hmm. But it's a long time ago. As I say, I wouldn't, it's not something that I would publicly discuss if other people didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. You'd never find it out about me from me. Okay, okay. Um. You, you studied um, politics and philosophy, I believe. Well, I didn't really. <laughs> uh, I, I spent three years uh, doing Marxism-Leninism and at a university where a very large number of my teachers were sympathizers. And so I got away with murder. I'm quite well versed still in the Marxist classics, which is basically what I was doing, but I paid very little attention to my course. So you, you oughtn't to deduce from the fact that I, I technically uh, f finished a course in philosophy and politics, that I know anything about either of them, because I don't. Okay, okay. <laughs> but the Marxism and Leninism is another thing. I know a lot about that in theory and practice. Mm -hmm. It was a very mm -hmm. busy Bolshevik in those times. Hmm. So what were your career aspirations growing up? My career aspirations were to become a journalist and to use my position to advance the cause. The cause being? The cause being Marxism-Leninism. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm toying as to whether to ask you at what point you decided to abandon that, but we're maybe oh, treading I, I on that. I pretty now. much abandoned, <laughs> no, I, 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 I actually resigned from the International Socialists, the, the, the Trotskyist group to which I belonged in 1975. I wish I'd kept a copy of the letter. I'm sure MI5 had it until they destroyed all those files in the late 90s. But uh, yeah, I, I, I actually resigned. I, didn't, I couldn't make it work anymore. I couldn't, um, I, I couldn't sustain a belief in it anymore. It didn't accord with practical experience of life, so I gave it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a quote um, to you. you you're, well, apparently this is something that you said. Um, is there any point in public debate in a society where hardly anyone has been taught how to think while millions have been taught what to think? I've, I've heard you say that similar things yeah, in, in interviews. I, it's, um, it, it's alas true, as you find. I find it on Twitter all the time. You engage with somebody. And I, I, I'm a great believer in the presumption of innocence. And in debate, I'm also a great believer in the presumption of intelligence. This is, I, will, I will treat somebody as intelligent until they've proved beyond reasonable doubt that they're stupid. <laughs> okay. uh, and I'm afraid an awful lot of people very quickly prove this. They cannot argue. They can't, t when you make a point to them which, which challenges what they say, they neither rebut it nor do they acknowledge it. They just go around it. They change the subject or they act as if you've never said it. And this basic failing of, 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 of being able to debate rationally comes from an inability to think. Uh, because people have been given a set of opinions which they've relied on all their lives and they can't cope when they're challenged. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this is Jonathan Swift, I think. You cannot reason a man out of a position he wasn't reasoned into in the first place. And most people don't hold their, what they believe to be their opinions because they've been persuaded of them. They hold them as a protective coloration in a society where you have to hold those opinions or you're not accepted. In a primitive society, someone like me would have been clubbed to death at an early age. <laughs> Fortunately, I grew up in a reasonably civilized society in which this hasn't happened, but uh, the, you can feel sort of the, the metaphorical desire to club me to death uh, growing in, in, in quite a lot of circumstances. So you, you go to certain meetings, uh, Oxford is the worst place in the world, is, where you can begin to hear a sort of howling roar coming from the audience when you say certain things. They can't bear it. They simply are unable to cope with the expression 
of an opinion which contradicts what they have been brought up to believe. Uh, and any rational person responds to, a, to, to an intellectual challenge by reason and debate and by countering it, but this is not rational. There's a huge irrationality in modern Britain mm -hmm. and indeed the modern Western world altogether. Mm -hmm. I'm skipping past my, my question here, I'll come back to it, but you, you say, so take Oxford for example, I mean, what are the most common things that you say that people can't tolerate? Oh, I can't be bothered to go over. I, I used to <laughs> engage in an awful lot of debates that I no longer bother with because I, I realised it was a complete waste of time. Uh, so rather than opening up a flank on those, I'll, I'll leave you to work it out. But I just, I just don't bother anymore. The existence of God? I just, I just can't. Be, I, I, I will. I, the existence of God is an opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, I, can't, I can only, all I can say about it is it's, it's a legitimate opinion, which is perfectly reasonable to hold. I'm not, that, that's the small ground on which, which I'll defend it. But the, the particular areas of, of, of the sexual revolution are ones in which it is just simply not possible to hold rational debate. Okay. So I don't. Yeah. Uh, it's simply an elephant trap into which conservatives regularly lumber. So they, 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 they walk straight into it. And the only result of it is, is that they find themselves surrounded by people screaming bigot at them. And I can't be bothered with it. There's no point. Mm -hmm. What would you win or gain or achieve by the part? perhaps from martyrdom. And I'm not really, a, I'm, not, I'm not actually a, a, somebody who desires martyrdom, mm -hmm. rather mm. the reverse. Hmm. So, so my, my question uh, in relation to the quote was, how do you think we can create a society that produces better thinkers? Well, we can't because we have destroyed the, the mechanisms by which we could do it and we've destroyed the mechanisms <laughs> by which we could uh, replace them. This is the, the reason why people say to me, what is your advice to young people? And I say, leave. And they laugh. And I say, well, I'm awfully sorry, that's not a joke. I mean, if, you have, if you're young enough to go and begin a new life in another country, you should do it. This is a, this is a, a doomed civilization in which we live. We destroyed our education system in the 1960s to such an extent that we are now ruled by idiots. And it, it, it's irrecoverable. I, I can argue rationally for the, for the restoration, for instance, of academic selection in state schools. Uh, and I will win every argument that I have. I always do. It's not, it's, it's, it's an, my case is unanswerable. But nothing will ever happen. Uh, it, 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 because we have turned our faces against this kind of thing. We prefer egalitarian politics to an educated society. Uh, the, whole, the whole project of comprehensivization of, of state schools was not an educational project. There had never been a discovery that comprehensive schools were better uh, than grammar schools uh, or academies as they, as they were mainly in Scotland. In fact, on the contrary, uh, Graham Savage, who invented the term comprehensive school and introduced the whole debate in the 1920s, admitted in his original paper that the educational standard was lower, though even he didn't realize how much lower it would be. Uh, but this, this has become such a testing point in politics. And for instance, everyone went on and on about, about, about Blair abandoning Clause 4 of the Labour Party Constitution. A clause for about the, the, the nationalization of the means of production, distribution, and exchange it was a completely dead letter and had been a dead letter since the days of Harold Wilson, 30 years before Blair ever went into politics. It didn't matter. The real, absolute, unalterable principle of labor at that time and since was comprehensive education. And the fascinating thing was they, they then went on to impose that on the Conservative Party. So the Conservative Party, particularly under David Cameron, explicitly. Uh, became wholly committed to comprehensive education. Why is this? You have to ask yourself. It's because it is an egalitarian project designed to alter the country and in a, in a political and social way at the expense of education. We decided to do that. Uh, very interestingly, when the former East Germany collapsed in a pile of rust in 1989 and proper local government of, of the German sort by, by state or Land was reintroduced. In every one of the East German Länder, uh, the, the, the public went to the authorities and said, can we please have the grammar schools back, which the communist East German regime destroyed? Because there were no grammar schools in, in communist East Germany. And there were secret ones for the elite, but there were not public ones. And I think in, in all of them, uh, they were restored successfully. I, I visited one in Wismar in the Baltic and attended the English class. And it, it, it was marvelous to see the children of dockers and doctors in the same classroom, uh, simply there on, on academic merit. And if you wonder why Germany is so much more economically successful, 
than Britain and why it's so much more stable and, and, and generally a well-educated and sensible country, then you have the answer. But we've turned our backs on that and, and, and any attempt to put it right will be defeated by political force, as so many other sensible policies will be defeated by political force. So we've had it. Come on. <laughs> it will not come back. Okay. That means I'd that love that's... it if it did, and I will continue to fight for it to do so on the, on the basis that I might be wrong. But I, I, everything that I see and hear, every encounter I have on this subject with anybody of any power influence tells me that it, that it has no chance. Mm -hmm. But if you don't educate people properly in the first place, then they won't be able to think. And if they can't think, then what use are they? How much do you think that that is the responsibility of the education system versus parents? Oh, the education system, any system becomes a defender of its own nature because people rise in it because they, they, they fit in well into the way that it's run. So the education system in this country before 1965 would have been full of people who were generally in favour of, of academic selection. The education system now is from the, from the local authorities to the academies, trusts to the unions, is full of people who believe in comprehensive education. And it's an interesting thing. People ludicrously think of, of Michael Gove, uh, the English education secretary, formerly, as an educational reactionary. He's not. He's, a, he's very much not a believer in academic selection and, uh, and will say so if asked. He's, 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 he's one of them. So you, you need to be to progress in any system, you need, to, you need to conform with its ethos, and people do so. But don't blame the education system, blame the political revolution of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we've had quite an insight into your, your views here, but uh, I'm going to ask, what are your, I'll pair this question as well with my follow-up question, what are your views on modern day Britain, and what do you think its position is in the world today? Its position in the world today is hugely exaggerated by itself. I mean, if, you live, if you live abroad in other, in other countries, you'll find that they spend very little time concerning themselves about Britain. They don't care about us very much. We impinge on them very little. Uh, and they often have a fanciful idea about what Britain is like. You know, bowl of hats, uh, afternoon tea, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and bobbies on bicycles. They're clueless about us, as we are often so clueless about them. And they, they don't know. Uh, I'm amazed at our economic rankings. I don't know how they can possibly be arrived at. I know at one stage the, the Italian economy was uprated once they, uh, once they put in a large notional sum for the size of the black economy run by the mafia. I think it may be the same in Britain, that we get an extra point because we have such an enormous debt uh, that it pushes us, us up the, the, the rankings of major economic nations. I can't see on what other basis we can be a major economic nation. What is it that we make that people rush to buy? Uh, why is we it's been decades now since anyone's even bothered to suggest that we should try and overcome our balance of payments deficit. Uh, we have a constant total current account deficit. We have an enormous public debt of a size normally only sustained by countries in wartime. We have an enormous private debt, which is in many ways even, even riskier. We have all the preconditions for, for something approaching hyperinflation. We have one of the worst education systems in the, in the advanced world. Uh, so, and we also have engineered a, an almost total moral collapse. So very large numbers of children are being brought up in single parent households in the, with, with an absent father, which all uh, sociological measure tells you means they have a, a disadvantage when in life as opposed to those who were brought up in a, in, a, in a complete family with a father and a mother. Yet we do this. It's, 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 it's pursued virtually as social policy, the, the abolition of marriage, the encouragement of all forms of family life. So there's so many things gathered together. Mm -hmm. And then add on top of that a criminal justice system made entirely of papier-mâché. And what have you got? And indeed, the, the de facto decriminalization of marijuana, one of the most dangerous drugs known to man. That's an interesting and So much to look statement. forward to. <laughs> and what I'm hoping is that I will die before I'm beaten to death in my own home. <laughs> do you believe that that's a real threat? Oh, I do, yeah. Seriously? I mean, you read about it all the time, but at the moment it only happens to, to, to lonely old people living in poor areas. That's not necessarily going to continue. It didn't happen at all 20 or 30 years ago. Now it happens to them. When's it going to start happening to the well-off middle class? I don't know. But it seems to me that, that once people realize that there isn't any authority 
in our society, which even the thickest person must be beginning to cotton on to, then who knows? The famous riot, riots in London and uh, one or two other places a few years ago, they weren't riots. They were outbreaks of, uh, of anarchy. Uh, in, in which it was very obvious for the first few hours that the authorities had no response. Mm -hmm. They weren't there. Mm -hmm. And some people might have taken a few lessons from that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I mean, when we spoke on the phone prior to this, um, I asked you a question as a, a sort of conduit to having, you know, qu questions for the interview. I said, what are you passionate about? Um, and you said, you're not passionate about anything, you're English. <laughs> and I said something about, that's quite pessimistic. And you said, um, pessimism is the key to happiness. It do, is. Yeah. Do, you do you believe that? Oh, completely, yeah. On, on what, Why wouldn't it on what be? basis? I don't be. Well, I, the, the, the pessimist is never disappointed. Okay. He's sometimes pleasantly surprised and he's always prepared. Uh, it, the, the, the optimist is constantly setting himself or herself up for, 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 for disappointment, rebuff and disaster by not being prepared for what life will bring. So what would be a realist? Well, I, realism is pessimism. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's an extension of Murphy's Law, isn't it? If it can go wrong, it, w it will. And we all know that from life. It's true. No. To be prepared for it, it's not. It's not complicated. I don't understand why people think that pessimism makes you miserable. It's, it's, uh, if if there were no pessimists, uh, this is a ridiculous cliche. People go, "Oh, I'm a glass half full man. I always look at the glass. I think it's half full." In that case, you're never going to buy the next round, are you? <laughs> uh, it's only the person who realizes that the glass is, is half empty. All glasses are half empty. Unless they're actually being filled, they're progressing towards emptiness, aren't they? But it's only the pessimist who's going to be there. So if you had no pessimists, no one would ever buy the next round. <laughs> well, that's a good enough reason. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you mentioned um, cannabis. I know what your stance is on, on drugs generally. Um, why are you why are you so opposed to, say, the legalization of cannabis? Well, it's particularly because of this thing that any alert person hears, and I, on more than one occasion in my life, have, have come across this pretty directly, of the devastating consequ consequences, particularly for, um, for children, of the use of marijuana. I, I know one particular instance of which I can speak publicly, uh, because my friend Patrick Coburn has written about it in a very moving book called Henry's Demons, about his son, Henry, uh, who, who, who was introduced to marijuana at his Canterbury Grammar School around about the age of 11, and who, as a result, and this is Patrick's phrase, went mad. I don't think anybody in, in that family has very much doubt about it. And the fascinating thing was that when Patrick went public about this, both in The Independent and in his book, how many of his circle of acquaintance came to him and said, the same things happened to me, but they kept quiet about it. It's a, it's, it I, I'm not sure whether epidemic is the word, but it's extraordinarily widespread. And the, the experience, even in the protected, safe, educated middle classes of this country, of people whose lives have been ruined, not just the person who, who used marijuana and who became permanently mentally ill and might have to live the rest of his life on powerful antipsychotics, the effects of which you possibly know, but they, they don't, uh, they're not kind to the person who takes them. Uh, it's, it's not just the, the effect on the person, of course, but on the effect on, on their family. The family mm -hmm. is, uh, if not actually destroyed, is stricken and permanently, irreversibly stricken. And for that reason alone, even if there were no other argument against it, and there are many, for that reason alone, the, the folly of suggesting that we should legalize and have on public sale in shops and readily available on the internet and advertised, which is what would happen. Uh, this horrible drug is just so irresponsible and cynical uh, that I cannot believe that anybody could be so stupid as to do it. And the only reason I can think of why this enormous cynical greed lobby survives and prospers is that it is composed of people who do understand that they propose to make billions of pounds out of human misery and don't care. They are the big tobacco of today. Okay. And I am astonished 
uh, that uh, people of the left, the, the, the old radical left, which at one time would have seen this horrible uh, episode of commercial greed for what it is, uh, find themselves on the side of the legalization campaign. I don't know what they think they're doing or what they think will happen if they succeed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a you, shocking inconsistency. You know, people who, who will buy fair trade coffee, who, who won't let their children drink uh, sh sugary canned drinks uh, or, 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 or mass produced burgers, but they will happily give support uh, to this lobby for one of the most unhealthy, dangerous products you can imagine. People who despise big tobacco and who regard cigarette smoking as moronic will still back this absurd campaign. It's total inconsistency. I don't know why they do it. Mm. Well, I, I have a suspicion as to why they do it, but I think they, they really ought to have more sense. Oh, but, I mean, there are proven medicinal benefits um, of things like CBD oil, um, and well, you, you may say so. I don't think that uh, there's a there's a there's some suggestion that that, that in some forms. Uh, Cannabidiol may be an effective treatment in certain forms of epilepsy. Um, mm -hmm. So GW Pharma have, um, have, have have done some work on that. Uh, that may be so, but CBD has very little to do with the principal active ingredient of marijuana, which is which is tetrahydrocannabinol, mm -hmm. the THC, a mm -hmm. completely different drug. And I think that arguments suggesting that, that that is a medicine are flimsy, to put it mildly, uh, and hard to establish by proper a double blind placebo testing for obvious reasons. But the the other thing about this is, is, is this simple point. You know what thalidomide is. Mm -hmm. You know why you've heard of it. But thalidomide at the beginning of its, uh, of its career as a drug was extremely effective against morning sickness in pregnant women. That's why people took it. Mm -hmm. The fact that a drug has a benevolent effect is not by itself enough to say that it should be licensed as a medicine. Uh, you have to check the side effects. If a drug has a benevolent effect in one respect but is also associated with permanent irreversible mental illness, then that would seem to me to be a major reason for not taking it. The other thing is this. Keith Stroop, uh, one of the founders of the American campaign for marijuana legalization, Normal, said in 1979 uh, uh, to a bunch of students in, uh, at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, that he was planning to use medicinal marijuana as a red herring to give pot a good name. Uh, I've, I tracked down the quote. He said he's, 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 he's since got quite touchy, and I, at one stage I think tried to suggest he hadn't said it, but he did. There's no question in my mind that the medical marijuana uh, campaign has always been a Trojan horse designed to get people to accept marijuana. If, if you think about it, it's completely irrelevant, even if it were in some kind of pill or, 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 or injectable form, uh, a, a drug which could be used under certain circumstances prescribed by qualified doctors. Why would that in any way be an argument for licensing it as a, as a recreational drug? There's no sense in it. Mm. If you can think, you can see instantly <laughs> that this is tripe, but people can't think. <laughs> and so the whole uh, episodes of, the, of, these, of, of these women with their desperately ill children, uh, which were brought before us uh, a, couple, a couple of years ago, uh, had absolutely nothing to do with the validity of legalizing marijuana as a recreational drug. And yet, somehow or other, they have achieved that effect. Have you ever used cannabis? Yeah. And did you have any negative... One of the stupidest things I ever did. Did, did you have any Which negative I side effects? I, I've never been a smoker, so I think I probably didn't really get much effect out of it at all. Okay. But it was one of those schoolboy things that, that um, I've s s stupidly... I, as I say, I, if, if I, looking back on it now, it, it makes me tremble with appalled shame in a way that several of the things that I did at that time in my life did because of the, 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 the risk that I ran, and not merely to myself, but to people in my life whom I loved. And I, I, I can't tell you how idiotic I now regard myself as having been at that time. 
people all make mistakes. They do, but there's, there, there's, what, what matters most about mistakes is what happens as a result. Do you recognize the mistake? Do you regret it? Do you, uh, do, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you learn from it, or do you instead use it as a way of encouraging other people to make the same mistake? Mm. And I find in so many public figures these days, oh yes, well I use marijuana as a student, and so it's ridiculous for us to make this fuss about it now. Well, it's a non sequitur, uh, but they, a lot of people now do this. Mm -hmm. I don't mind. You know, people, you know, people, everybody has done stupid things in their past. I, I don't expect anybody to be perfect. I'm saying the whole basis of the Christian religion is that we're all imperfect, but it's it's what you make of it, uh, as in the the the, you know, the, the confession and the, the prayer book communion service. The remembrance of it is grievous unto us, the burden of it is intolerable. Uh, these are things which you you did, which you can never necessarily recover uh, from, or, 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 or you can certainly never undo, but you have to learn that, that you are capable of doing really stupid things and that you should restrain yourself from doing them and never ever offer an, an example to anybody else which might make them do something equally stupid. On the contrary, your example should always be to, to, to steer people away from them. What, what's your biggest regret? I'm not telling you. Fair enough. <laughs> well, fair enough or unfair enough, I'm not telling you. No, that's, that's <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, you know, what fascinates me about you, Peter, is that when you oppose an idea, you do so with such fervor and such passion. Why is it's that? It's not passion. <laughs> well, what is it then, and why is it? Well, if, if something if 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 something is wrong, uh, I, I, it's the uh, Immanuel Kant's great uh, statement of, of wonder. The two things which are most uh, disturbing to the non-believer: it's the blazing stars in the sky above and the burning conscience within. Everybody, I think. Uh, who's remotely human has experienced conscience, and it is an extraordinary thing, and it's a great motivation. We th there are some things which we intuitively know to be wrong while we're doing them, and even on some occasions while we're saying them. Now, why is that? Are you asking me? <laughs> well, I'm saying it's <laughs> worth considering, isn't it? I can't. Yeah. I can't offer you. A, <laughs> An answer, but it suggests to me that we are uh, that we have a duty on some occasions, not merely to resist these things in ourselves, but to do all we can to make sure that other people don't do them either. So help to create a society in which, at the very least, people are not under pressure to do wrong, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe is the kind of society we now have. I think people are under constant pressure to do wrong. Interesting. I mean, to, to, to your point, I think that humans probably have an innate sense of right or wrong. You know, just for, from from birth. Yeah, so well, that's which raises the question of if it is what it appears to be, and if it isn't just your bile duct giving you trouble, <laughs> uh, then this must surely lead you to on to further speculations. Hmm. How, how do you define God? Of the creator of the universe. Creator of the universe. Mm. And, and I mean, I could go on. Uh, yeah, if you. But if that's you could, I, well, but, I, but, you, but the, the, <laughs> it's it, it's not. It, there isn't. Once you've established that, I, that seems to me to be significant enough subject to take up several weeks of debate and study. <laughs> before you need to do anything else, really. The question really is, I'm, I'm intrigued as to what your um, perception of God is, because I, I don't think... Well, my perception of God is, 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 is as, because I'm a Christian, is as revealed to us in the life of, of Jesus Christ our Lord, and particularly in his known sayings and, and doings while he was on this earth, mm -hmm. which is revealed to us. But that's a Christian position. Other people might take another. I'm, I'm just that, that's that's what my opinion of it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
In, in what way do you think a more God-believing Britain would be different? Well, any, the, 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 we, we're currently living in an experiment of trying to find out how long a society, a civilization based upon a belief in Christianity can endure after the belief in Christianity has died. I don't think it's that long. It's the, there, there is definitely a period, which I refer to as the afterglow, between the death of the sustaining belief and the death of the civilization, and we're living in it. Uh, but I think we're all going to find out. At the moment, we still live in a society in which everything that surrounds us, from the architecture and the music and the customs and the manners and the language and the food and everything else, has been for, for centuries a development of Christian thought and belief. <laughs> and when that belief is more or less extinguished or becomes a, a, a minority peculiarity so uh, so small as to be ignorable, then we'll find out how people can get along without it. How, how do you think other people perceive you? Uh, it depends which other people you're talking about. I mean, just in general. I, but I don't much care. No, I'm not. I'm not asking you to care. I'm just curious as to what you, how you think other people experience you as a person. It's for them, it's, it's, that's for them to worry about, not for me. I can't. <laughs> well, just I, yeah. uh, you know, you, you've said, or I've heard you say, you you find uh, that a lot of people hate you. Well, I think some people do. Yes, if I know some people do. Some people write to me and tell me so. And so, what is it about you that you think is? Uh, well, they don't like what I think. Worthy, worthy of hate. They don't like what I think, and they don't like what I say. So they they think that I must be a bad person. And I will often write back, and they'll say, "No, you're ugly, fat. You know, you, uh, you're you know, this, that, and the other." And uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, and I write back and say, "Well, all these all these things may be true, but it doesn't matter. The question is, am I right?" But it doesn't. You can't you can't sit around worrying about what. Other people think of you. Uh huh. Yeah. It's one of the great, pitiful, observable things about modern politics is that you see these politicians and they worry about what newspapers say about them. Oh, come on. Why would you do that? <laughs> but you said you worry about whether you're right. I mean, how can you. I ever, do worry about whether how, I'm right. Being right, is, being right is important, but what, <laughs> the, what the Guardian says about you isn't important. How can you ever know whether you're. It's testable, totally right. isn't it? In terms of if, if if the if the consequences of 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 your actions are as you intended them to be, and are good, then that would seem to be as near as you can get to being to being able to show that you're right. If 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 I were able to pursue the, the policies that I desire, I would think this country would be a better place, uh, quite quickly actually, demonstrably. Certainly, by f failing to follow any of my ideas at all, uh, we we steadily make uh, this country a worse place. Okay. Have you ever had any addictions? Addiction doesn't exist. <laughs> I couldn't have had one. There is no such thing. I thought, I thought you were going to say that. Well, I know you did. But, uh, I, had thought I, I, I thought I'd oblige you with it quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I mean, I've got. Uh, I know you're uh, not not necessarily a fan of Russell Brand, but he thinks that uh, uh, Russell Brand has said one very sensible thing, which is uh, which, and I think he's actually quite intelligent. I have hopes for Russell Brand. I don't think that um, that he's without uh, intelligence. I, I think sooner or later he may surprise us all. The most specific thing that he's said is that the methadone program is a stupid and wasteful and mistaken policy, in which he's absolutely right, it is. Okay. And anybody who can see that can't be entirely uh, lost. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, Russell Brand's take on addiction is that it stems from disconnection. Um, well, that's just a collection of syllables, isn't it? <laughs> Johan Harry, uh, who is a well-known author and TED uh, speaker. Johan Harry and I, the, he wouldn't agree with this, and I've written a long essay of, about when he brought out his book, Chasing the Scream, uh, about this. Johan Harry's view of addiction and mine are actually very similar. But because he's a, a left-wing radical person, he gets away with it, whereas I don't. Okay. I've, there's a very long essay on, on my blog about about Johann Harris writing and chasing the screen about addiction, uh, which makes this point far more elaborately and uh, with obviously with the necessary quotations, which I can't produce here. But it is astonishing sure. okay. uh, how much how strong the parallel is. 
That's interesting. I'll, I'll check Looking that out. Up. Definitely. Um, what, he, he, what he says is the opposite of addiction is connection. I don't know to what degree you agree with that. Well, um, I have no idea what, what, what addiction <laughs> is connection means or what connection <laughs> is addiction means. It's just, it's just he, 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 he who digs deepest, deepest digs. Sort of <laughs> or that, that uh, there's those things that students used to put on their walls. Uh, Desiderata. Vacuous maxims. I don't know. It's just, it, it's just babble. <laughs> um, Dr. Gabor Mati, who's one of the world's leading authorities in addiction, says mental illness, addiction, and most chronic illnesses linked to childhood loss and to trauma. Well, <laughs> but, but you don't you, think you can say that if you want to. But any, any, any <laughs> sentence in which addiction is a, is a subject or an object is, is itself vacuous because there is no such thing. So this is what I suppose ultimately interests me is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the 12 steps program that is used to treat people with addiction. Yeah, it's vaguely, um, but I, I think it's also changed, hasn't it? Um, no, I'm not sure. I think the original one was more, was more uh, because it, the, the origin of it, I think, was immoral rearmament, and therefore the, the origin of it was more religious than it is now. But I think it, I well, think, I think it has changed. Well, I mean, it, so step three specifically in the 12 steps is um, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. I mean, God I don't, is a very, Do they still say that? Yeah, yeah, very much so, yeah. Okay, I, I mean, God is a very prominent and... Uh, you know, sort of theme throughout the, the 12 steps. And ultimately the belief in a higher power or in a God is the thing that helps pull people out of whatever their struggle is. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I had had some impression that in some versions of Alcoholics Anonymous and so forth, the, the religious um, aspect had been toned down a bit in recent years. Yeah, but so I'm that, not having any direct experience, I'm, I'm only speaking from hearsay really. Yeah, I mean, where do you think spirituality and religion um, intersect or coexist? Well, I don't know what spirituality is. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, so uh, I couldn't tell you, but I, I think that it would seem to me that you would need uh, that, look. People I know who have who, who have been uh, what would once have been called drunkards in their lives and who have stopped, and I've known quite a few of them, have all said the same things. Is that you, you stop if and when you decide to stop. That's it. Whatever resource they find that helps them to do so, in some cases it may be religious faith, in some cases it was, in some cases it wasn't. But they decided, so if you don't want to stop, you won't stop, is what they've said to me. But the, the mere fact that they have stopped is, is the crucially important fact. Do you think the idea of gods can exist out with religion? I can't, I, I mean, you'd have to, you, I, the problem with the English language is that it's uh, it, it's not like French, where there's an academy which says this is what words you can use and this is what they mean. The English language is a bit more like common law. It's a, it's a series of precedents. I I don't. I, it seems to me to be faintly absurd to attempt to have a religion with without God or a God without religion, but I, I suppose you could contrive it if you if you were clever enough, but I'm not very interested in pursuing this kind of tedious English linguistic philosophy that I had quite enough of Okay. when I was a lad. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll read you quickly. Um, I, I found this online. Uh, this is somebody's take on it. God is consciousness, not a creator, but the source of creation itself. God is not independent of you, but the totality of everything. You sort of hear whale music in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you don't buy that? Well, I, it, if it makes you happy, but it, it doesn't do anything for me. So the idea of God exists very uh, much so within the, the framework of a religion? Well, I think so. Yeah. But have it your way. It's, okay. a, it's not, it's, it, it, uh, religion, is, religion is an opinion. Mm -hmm. mm. What do you but think I, I prefer Isaiah in the King James Version to that kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> um, what, what do you feel is your own purpose in life? Hmm. Uh, what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? I think that's the basic summary. And then after that, uh, the, what, what follows from that is you know, to, to discover what it is that we're intended to do and to attempt in so far as you can to do it again whatsoever thy hand findeth to do do it with thy might 
What what does all of that mean in layman's terms? It means doing <laughs> it means doing what I do. Doing what you do, which mm. is which is uh, in my private life to do certain things as well as I can, and in mm -hmm. my public life to uh, to stand as firmly as I can for what I believe to be good. That's, that sounds like a good way to live one's life. Well, I don't know whether <laughs> it's good or not, but it's, it's it, if if you're if you're seeking for a a, a way to live life, it's, it is the, it is one which seems to me to work. It, you'll, you will fail uh, at any in any attempt to live a good life. It will will be attended by failure because of the nature of fallen humanity. But it, it is it is a way. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I absolutely don't proselytize. I don't try to persuade other people to do things the way that I do them. I don't imagine a lot of people would find the way that I do them particularly attractive anyway. <laughs> but uh, what I genuinely admire about you, whilst my um, you know opinions or beliefs may differ somewhat, is the fact that you are willing to say what you believe fully. Well, that's a point. I mean, as I say, I will I will avoid certain subjects because I, I, there is there is absolutely no point in arguing with fanatics, for instance. Mm -hmm. and I can't be bothered, so I just stay steer clear of certain things because I just I just won't do it. Do you consider yourself an open-minded person? Well, I think I can prove it. In mm -hmm. that I have substantially changed my mind on most major and a lot of minor issues in my life. I can show it to and so, and I, I've, and I can tell you that changing your mind is not particularly easy. D d so do you continue that then? Well, I think it's, it, 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 if, if I've shown that I'm capable of it, I'm, I've shown that I understand the nature of it, I've, shown, I've, I've been through the experience of it, I can explain how it happens, I know the, I know the means by which the, the human mind seeks to close itself against unwelcome truth. Uh, and so I could recognize it. I can't say for certain that I, th that I would be able to change my mind again if I, if I were persuaded that things that I believed were wrong. But I like to think that I could have done, that I could do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you like your legacy to be? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't um, it, it doesn't. These are sort of these these colour settlement ten questions things. I, I, I have no idea. I can't answer them. What do you think your brother's legacy is? I don't know. Uh, I, I actually had never really considered that. What do you think of it? Um, I mean, a, a major thought leader in the idea of atheism, <laughs> perhaps. Mm. No, maybe. Um, uh, you know, uh, and, I, and I think you have to wait quite a while before you find out what's um, uh, what somebody has or has not left behind them. Perhaps I mean certainly he was regarded, I think, as an, an exceptional thinker. But I, but I think similarly of you. I just think that his beliefs were more popular. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. D does that? Does well, that no, the I, the, here's a funny thing. I mean, I don't. I, I, uh, Anything that I say on this subject is open to misinterpretation, not just open to misinterpretation, but bound to be misinterpreted. But on this, I will say that I'm fascinated always by the way in which my brother's admirers will say, well, yes, he had this, I, I really admire him fantastically for his atheism. But he say, yes, okay, but what about his support for the Iraq war and his belief in weapons of mass destruction? They start shuffling their feet. <laughs> but of, of the two, uh, the, the, in his lifetime, it's, I, I think probably the more important and significant was the WMD in the Iraq War. Uh, and it, the interesting thing is that this, this doesn't tell you anything at all about either my brother or about the Iraq War or about atheism. It, it does tell you about the people involved. Uh, that what they they were much more concerned by the liberation, the personal liberation offered to them by atheism than they were about the horrible uh, military destruction of a whole area of the world uh, and the terrible cruelty and disaster that it involves and the diplomatic and political catastrophe which continues to reverberate years afterwards. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, 
if someone stands up and says, God's a myth, the whole thing's a joke, everything your parents and pastors and teachers have told you about it is twaddle, and does it in an articulate and eloquent fashion, then they're saying to you, you're free. You have complete autonomy over your own body. And that's what people wanted. Mm. And that's why they seized on it. Mm. But when it came to, say, one of, one, of the, one of the most foolish and discredited political positions anybody's ever taken, it's given a free pass. Mm. You explain it to me. Mm. How do you define success? I don't. Uh, but I, there's a very good saying, which is, call ma no man happy until he's dead. <laughs> What's what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? I'm not a great receiver of advice. <laughs> Though I was once told early on in my Fleet Street career to put on a bit of weight if I wanted to be taken seriously. Is that right? Really? Yeah, well, as you can see. <laughs> what weights were you then? I should think I was about 11 stone. Okay. Gosh, what those fascinating were the days. piece of advice that is. Mm. I'm not sure it was the best piece of advice. That <laughs> was the easiest to take. <laughs> uh, so that's that's the one that comes to mind. Well, I see you. You asked for some advice that I had. <laughs> okay. I, 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 but I'm not. I don't. I didn't. I'm afraid to take your question terribly seriously. Oh, uh, okay. But again, it Fair is another, another of those colour settlement questions. Yes. I mean, they're questions that I personally yes. like, but they're not everyone's yeah. taste. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you had the opportunity to speak to your twenty-year-old self, what would you say? I don't think we'd. I, don't, I, I think. I, I think we'd. We'd walk out on each other. I don't think there'd be much. Do you think so? Way of conversation. There. If uh, if twenty-year-olds knew what sixty-seven-year-olds knew, uh, if sixty-seven-year-olds had the vigor and strength of twenty-year-olds, this wouldn't be the world that it is. So how can one impart? you know, that sort of knowledge to the other. They can't, and it seems to me by design, it, this is not meant to be so. In I know a, a 20 year old who had the wisdom of a 67 year old would be an intolerable person, wouldn't he or she? So, so in accordance with universal laws, it's just not meant to it be. It doesn't seem to be so, does it? <laughs> I don't know why, it's one of those in, ineluctable mysteries that, I, you know, that we're stuck with. Yeah, yeah. Last question um, for you, Peter, it's a big question. If you could change anything in the world, what would it be and why? I don't want to change anything in the world. There, right. are, there are many things I want to ameliorate, but the whole idea of, of trying to create and indeed gain personal association with the creation of a utopia is blasphemous as far as, far as I'm concerned. The world is more or less as it is. Uh, the thing you can most readily reform in it is yourself. Mm. Mm. I mean, you're, you're quoted as saying the problem of utopia is that it can only be approached across a sea of blood and you never arrive. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I think that's demonstrable. So taking um, from 1789 onwards, yeah, there's plenty of blood, no utopia. Mm -hmm. So taking personal responsibility. The, it is uh, the great bridge from revolutionary politics to a, to a, a, a thoughtful and practical social democracy for many people was a writer called Arthur Kirstler, who's now fallen out of fashion because of some revelations about his despicable personal behavior. But uh, one of the things that he was very good on was the problem of world reformers, uh, which is the, the thing they principally needed to reform was invariably themselves. And I think that a lot of us who in our teens and 20s set out to change the world learned that it wasn't the world we had to change. Mm -hmm. And I'll stick with that. Well, Peter, I know you need to watch your time, but um, I just want to say I've had an immense uh, time speaking with you. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it in some sense. It's well, I'm not sure enjoy is the word, but I think... <laughs> I, 
we, we, we seem to have got through it without uh, either of us reaching across the table and trying to strangle the other one, so I suppose that's an achievement. <laughs> that, was, that was, I genuinely would never have been my intention. What, not um, even not even for a moment, not once? So no, no not for me. I may have failed in that case. <laughs> I, f I find you to be a likable person. I don't know what people keep have that, such a problem with. Keep that, uh, keep that to yourself. I remember when Decker Aitken had uh, interviewed me for The Guardian and, and she said um, at one point, I find him impossible to dislike. And plenty of people wrote to The Guardian saying, it's not a difficulty I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter, thank you so much for your time and, and thank you. It's been well, a pleasure. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Cheers.